Hello and welcome back to Math 301 Combinatorics at CSU. Today we will be talking about sequences. So sequences are coming up at this point in the course because we talked last time about the distinction between when order matters and when order doesn't matter in a counting problem. So when order doesn't matter, we commonly use sets to model our questions. We talked a lot about sets uh, last week and we see that for instance, two, four, five, the set containing two, four, and five is equal to the set containing four, five, and two. They're not different sets just because we wrote the elements in a different order. But when order matters, what we want to use is sequences. And sequences are the mathematical object of ordered lists. So two, comma, four, comma, five is a sequence. That's different from the ordering four, comma, five, comma, two. So that's the main difference between a sequence and a set. We can also have infinite sequences like one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, where we have an infinite number of um, numbers or other objects written in a list. Now, how do we write down sequences formally? Well, one common way is to give uh, subscripts to a variable like a. So a1, a2, a3, up to an would be a way of writing down an arbitrary sequence of length n. And similarly, we can write down a0, a1, a2, up to an if we wanted a zero index. So this is called zero indexing when we start at zero. And it's, sometimes you start at one, sometimes you start at zero, just depending on what is more convenient. But be careful, this sequence has length n plus one, not n, because we have that a0. Zero index sequences are very common in computer science because a lot of programming languages index their lists starting at zero. We can also, of course, have infinite lists a1, a2, dot, 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 or a0, a1, a2, dot, dot, dot. We can define sequences with formulas. For instance, say we wanted to define the following sequence, a, to be a0, a1, a2, dot, 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 by the formula a sub i equals two to the i. So the way we calculate what this sequence means is a sub zero is two to the zero, which is one, and then a sub one is two, and a sub two is four and eight. These are the powers of two in order each time we multiply by two. We will see later in the course how to define sequences recursively in terms of previous elements of the sequence. But for now, we're just going to focus on directly defined sequences using formulas. Now, we can actually also think of sequences as functions in a sense. Notice that the formula a sub i equals 2 to the i looks a lot like the formula f of x equals 2 to the x. In both cases, you plug in something, either i or x, to the formula on the right and get some value. Now the difference is the function f of x equals 2 to the x usually refers to a function on the real numbers. So you can plug in any real number along the number line and get some value on this curve, which I drew in blue here. That's the plot of f of x equals 2 to the x. And then the plot of the sequence is just actually the set of black dots here. So this 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. So how do we define a function in general so that that encompasses sequences? Well, a function from a set A to a set B for any two sets A and B is an assignment of each element of A to one element of B. So here's an example when A is the natural numbers and B is also the natural numbers. Plotting our sequence above from, the, from up here, um, we, we make zero map to one and one maps to two and two maps to four and three maps to eight and so on. Each number is pointing to uh, 2 to the i, so i points to 2 to the i. So that represents a sub i equals 2 to the i. In this case, the set a is the natural numbers and so is the set b. Not everything in b is pointed to by an arrow and that's okay. So a sequence is a function from the natural numbers or the set 1 through n, um, if it's a finite sequence, to some other set b, which is called the alphabet of the sequence because it's sort of the letters that appear in the sequence when we write it down as a list. So let's look at other examples of sequences here. Here's a sequence with a, a smaller alphabet. The, small, the smaller alphabet here is just the set of four letters, A, C, G, and T. Those are the four symbols that appear when you're writing down a DNA sequence. And so in order to write down a DNA sequence, we can think of it as a way of assigning to each number from one through some number, in this case three, some letter from A, C, G, or T. -T. So let's look at one example. Our first example is going to be making one point to C and two point to A and three point to T. That means the first letter is C and then A and then T. So we can write that, that down as a sequence also with parentheses and commas here. So C comma A comma T is this sequence thought of as a function. Here's another example. What if we make one, two, and three all point to A? 
Well, then that's just the sequence a comma a comma a. So we can write that down as well. Um, it's fine to have repeated elements in the sequence. And that's another difference between sequences and sets. sets in sets, we usually don't write the same element twice. We, uh, it's just a collection of distinct objects. And sequences can have repeated letters and order matters. So in a sense, the sequence is a completely opposite thing from a set. Now those two examples above with C, A, and T and triple A make us want to write the sequences without the commas sometimes. And you can do this as long as your alphabet consists of one symbol elements like A, C, G, and T. Each of those elements have just one symbol to write them down. So it's not confusing if we drop the commas and write out the sequence as a string, or it's all, this is also called a word. A string in this case being cat, and in this case just being A, A, C, G, A, T, some DNA sequence of length six here, and we can just write it as a string, dropping the commas and dropping the parentheses. Very, very common example of strings, especially in computer science, is binary strings, where the alphabet that we use is the set containing zero and one. So those are the two letters that can appear in our string. And so for example, one zero one one zero one zero is an example of a binary string of length seven. So of course, we're doing combinatorics here, so we have to ask how many binary strings of length seven are there? And so the way you can count this is by saying, well, the, the first letter can be either zero or one. That's two possibilities. And for each of those, there's two possibilities for the next letter and the next letter and the next letter and the next letter. Independently, there's two possibilities for each. And so we multiply them all together to get two to the seventh or 128. There's 128 binary sequences or strings of length seven. And this answers our question in general about counting strings. We can do a same, the same thing for counting the strings of length K from an alphabet of size N. So up there, we had an alphabet of size two. And if we had N letters instead of just two, then there's N possibilities for each element of the sequence. And so it's N times N times N K times or N to the K. Now notice this formula n to the k answers one of the questions from the last video, which is how many ways can we choose k things from n things where order matters and repeats are allowed? So in this case, we just modeled it by counting strings, which are ordered objects where repeats are allowed and we have n possibilities for each thing. So we have this general formula now of n to the k. We can also, with similar reasoning, understand the case of when repeats aren't allowed, but order still matters, by asking how many strings of k distinct letters can be chosen from an alphabet of size n. These are also sometimes called ordered subsets, because a subset has no repeats, and so you take a subset of elements, and then you just put them in order, in some order. So an ordered subset is a subset with an order, or an ordered set is a set with an order. And so in other words, it's a sequence with all distinct elements. That's another way of saying it. Now in this case, there's n possibilities for the first letter, but then there's only n minus one for the next letter because it can't agree with the first one. And then n minus two left for the next and so on, down to n minus k plus one, so that there are k factors in this product. And we can also alternatively write this in terms of factorials. It's n factorial divided out by n minus k factorial all the numbers down here that we didn't write in the thing that's appro approximating a factorial. So this gives us another formula, n factorial over n minus k factorial for order matters and repeats not allowed, choosing k things for n things. Now interestingly, we can use that to count unordered subsets. Even though we started out with ordered things, it turns out to be very useful to deduce the formula for how many k element subsets can we choose from a set of size n? So this is the ordinary choose problem, and we might recognize it as n choose k because we talked about it before, but let's try to derive it from what we've just done before with strings. So in this case, we have order doesn't matter, and repeats are not allowed because it's subsets. Again, repeats are not allowed, order doesn't matter. And so in this case, we can say, well, first let's start with the formula for when order did matter, so we have n factorial divided by n minus k factorial ordered subsets of size k. And then once you count all those with order, you ask how much did we overcount? Well, we overcounted each set of size k 
by however many ways we could have ordered it, which is k factorial. k factorial is the number of ways of putting an ordering on a set of size k. And so we just have to divide by k factorial by the division principle. We have n factorial divided by n minus k factorial divided by k factorial. And so we get the formula n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial, which we recognize as the formula for n choose k. And so we've actually derived from the ordered situation of counting strings and sequences, the formula for how many ways can we choose k things from n things in an unordered way. Now this link sometimes goes the other way as well. Sometimes you're counting ordered things and you actually have to use a formula coming from unordered counting in order to actually get the right answer. So you have to be careful depending on how the problem is phrased. Say we wanna count the number of binary strings of length seven that have exactly three zeros. So remember a binary string only has zeros or ones. And we wanna to restrict to the case where exactly three of them are zeros. So you can think of having seven letters, zeros or ones, and you're choosing which positions contain the zeros. So which three positions out of one through seven contain the zeros? Once you choose that, that the ones have to be in all the other places. So there's no more choices to make. So there's only seven choose three ways of doing that, which it seems like we would use this seven choose three formula when we're counting subsets. But in this case, we're counting strings and the restriction that we have exactly three zeros means we should use the choose formula, seven choose three. So we have seven times six times five over three factorial, which is 35 possibilities in this case. So these formulas go hand in hand and they go back and forth. And you just have to think in each problem, or as, is what I'm counting ordered or is it unordered? But in general, going back to the table that we saw in the last video, remember when we're counting how many ways to choose k things from n things, how many combinations are there? We could either be talking about unordered sets or ordered sequences, which we talked about today. And we can say that all the elements have to be distinct or we could allow repeats. And so here were the three formulas that we saw today, n to the k, n factorial over n minus k factorial, and n choose k. And of course, there's one we haven't done yet, um, unordered sets that allow repeats. This will be done next time. It's one of the harder formulas and it involves a method called sticks and stones. It's also mathematically, in terms of a, a mathematical object that it's counting, the right term is multi-sets. It's sets where you're allowed repeated elements, but there's no order. So it's a little bit more tricky, and so we're going to devote an entire video to it uh, at next time. So now you try. How many strings of length 7 from the alphabet 0, 1, and 2 have exactly three zeros? So here now, instead of binary strings, we're looking at trinary strings, where you're allowed three different letters, but we're still saying, okay, you have exactly three zeros. How many possibilities are there? And that's all for today, and we will see you next time.